A reading from Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 to 14. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than this, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God, based on faith. I want to know Christ, and by the power of his resurrection, and the sharing of his suffering by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Well, not to brag, but I actually come from some pretty impressive stock. What are you laughing about? <laughs> all right, I'll prove it. I'll prove it. First of all, foreman is an Anglo-Saxon word, which means pig farmer, flower man. Oh, yeah, you laugh. But it wasn't, uh, it wasn't too long ago pig farming was a big deal. In fact... Not only did many well-to-do persons farm pigs back in the old country, but they were smart enough to live upwind from the pigs. So, one of my ancestors was an earl, appointed by Richard III to put him in charge of the kingdom's heraldry. That was a kind of a database for coats of arms. That's why that, so nobody could have two foxes on the same coat of arms, you see. Somebody had to keep track of that stuff. That was my ancestor, the Earl of Foreman. Here's ours, by the way. See, you thought I was kidding. That's the Foreman coat of arms, and it's spelled, by the way, F-O-U-R-M-A-N, just so you know, okay? One of my ancestors was the Lord High Mayor of London in 1508. Uh, it was an annual thing. The, they got the richest man around, they elected the mayor for a year and, you know, got him to buy a big party for everyone, but, you know, it worked. In the early 1600s, not Plymouth Rock early, but pretty early, all of my ancestors hit the shores of Massachusetts Bay Colony and settled in. Eventually, they moved inland to New Jersey, which was a nice place back in those days. Uh, and another one of my ancestors there, General David Foreman, served under George Washington. In fact, uh, he was in charge of coast watching, and his letters can still be found in the National Archives. Look it up. Google it. By the early 1800s, my family had uh, continued their western migration to Ohio, and during the Civil War, my, my great uncle Harold Weaver fought and died at the Battle of Chickamauga with the 16th Ohio Infantry. My grandfather, Ray, was, uh, was drafted to serve in World War I, but because he was a pig farmer, they deferred him. See, you thought it was a bad deal. My uncle Ward was a tail, tail gunner on a B-24 Liberator during World War II. He won the Distinguished Flying Cross. Uh, that's a big deal. There we go. It's uh, kind of like the uh, Air Force's version of the uh, Medal of Honor. And then my uncle Bob received the Bronze Star for heroism in uh, Vietnam. My dad served in Puerto Rico during the Korean War, just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> As I said, it's a fairly impressive family tree. Of course, not every branch of the tree is bragging material, you understand. I had, a, I had an uncle, Jeremiah, well, great, great, great uncle, who was a fur trapper. He tracked from Harrisburg, West Virginia, to Greenville, Ohio in the early 1800s, and was a very ambitious man in that he planted a few dozen Jeremiah Juniors along the way, <laughs> uh, which accounts for my dark coloration and my high cheekbones and my wide body. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight, we began by reading Paul's uh, recounting of his rather impressive family tree. Yet even as he regales us with how impressive his personal history is, he reminds us that in the end, None of it matters. All that matters, he says, is Christ. And he makes a rather profound statement. Forgetting what lies behind, straining forward 
to what lies ahead. In fact, I'm going to share with you uh, Eugene Peterson's excellent translation of this because I think it's better. All the things I once thought were important are gone from my life. Compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ as my master, firsthand, everything I once thought I had going for me is just dog dung. I've dumped it all in the trash so I can embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I don't want to some pity, petty inferior brand of faith that comes from keeping a list of rules when I can have a faith that comes from embracing Jesus Christ. I gave up all that inferior stuff so I could know Christ personally, experience the power of his resurrection, be a partner in his suffering, and go all the way with him to the cross. Because if there's any way to get in on the resurrection, I want to do it. Friends, don't get me wrong. I do not count myself an expert, but I do have my eye on the prize, where God is beckoning me on toward Jesus, so I'm off and running, and I am never looking back. We tend to carry a lot of baggage through life. Paul says, forget it. If it hurts you or someone else, forget it. If it causes division, forget it. If it drags you down or burdens your heart or puffs you up or makes you think you have all the answers, Forget it. It's just trash. It's rubbish. Or as Peterson calls it, it's dog dung. And as the Greek word there is scubion, scubalon. It's my favorite Greek word, by the way. I'm going to show it up here on the screen. There we go. Scubalon. See? Scubalon. Uh, it's uh, my favorite Greek word because the most English, uh, accurate English translation is, guess what? Crab. That's right. <laughs> you call it crab. I mean, so you always learn the cuss words in, lang in foreign languages first. And, and that, by the way, is a polite translation. The grudges we hold against others, the anger that we nurture, the unforgiving heart that drives a wedge between us and God and between us and one another, it's all crap. That's Paul's word, not mine. Paul invites us to make a critical judgment about how we use our past. The past can remind us of the goodness Christ comes connects us to the greatness of the faith of those who went before us, can even draw us closer to God. The past can cause us to learn humility and rely on grace instead of our own works. We're honored to carry that kind of a past with us. But when the past holds you back, when it causes you to puff up, well, that's crap, and it needs to be thrown away. That's why Paul says, strain toward what lies ahead. Because every opportunity for growth is an act of straining toward what lies ahead because that's the way it is. You want to know what the first ELCA expert that we consulted back in 1996 said to us when we talked about her dreams of building this building? She said, you can't do it. You're too small. You will never be able to raise that kind of money. We invited her to the opening ceremony. And back in 2000, when the Synod was asked for advice on how we could expand our staff, two full-time pastors, some other people. You know what they said to us? Don't do it. You'll put too great a strain on your budget, it'll tear you apart. They were at every installation of every pastor. Pastor Sue, Deacon Robin, Deacon Nancy, most recently Pastor June, wouldn't want them to stay home and miss this place. Oh no. Every new ministry, every new effort has been a straining toward what lies ahead. There have been years when it was a strain to make ends meet, Years when the Air Force decimated our leadership and our worship attendance. Years when social or community issues like the sexuality issue or the collapse of the economy or the multiple school levy failures. Oh, and I don't know, maybe a two-year pandemic caused strain amongst us. We saw each as an opportunity to strain toward what lies ahead. Paul encourages us, press on toward the goal. And the goal we work toward tells others what we think is important. At Abiding Christ, our goal is to help others come to know Jesus, to help them stand as responsible persons before him. These aren't just words. They describe who we are and what we do and why we do it. Paul says the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus is the goal. And though we may not reach it, we press on. Even Paul doesn't claim to have reached the goal. He says, I'm not saying I have it all together, that I have it made, but I'm on my way. I'm reaching out for Christ, who has so wonderfully reached out for me. And that brings us to the portion of the baptismal vow we are considering tonight. To participate in the Lord's Supper. 
that time and place where Christ reaches out to you. Mother Teresa was once asked, when you pray, what do you say to God? And she said, I don't ask, I listen. And then she was asked, well, what does God say to you? She said, he doesn't talk either, he listens. And if you don't understand that, I can't explain it. Communion is that place where Christ embraces us and where we embrace Christ. It's an experience that goes beyond human language. It is a holy moment. Luther once said, you can't explain it. You just have to worship it. And that's what it's all about. That's what we're called here to do regularly, to embrace the Christ who has so wondrously reached out to embrace us. It's not our family. It's not our personal histories that matter. What matters is what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Everything else, everything else is, oh, I don't know, what's the word I'm looking for here? Oh, yeah, crap. As Paul says, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from this life. Everything I once thought I had gone for me, it's just dog dung. I've dumped it in the trash so I can embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I won't settle for some petty, inferior kind of faith that comes from keeping a list of rules when I can get a robust faith that comes from embracing Jesus Christ. I gave up all that inferior stuff so I could know Christ personally, experience the power of his resurrection, be a partner in his suffering, go all the way with him to the cross. If there is any way to get in on the resurrection, I want to do it. Friends, don't get me wrong. I don't count myself as an expert in all of this, but I do have my eyes on the prize. Where God is beckoning me on toward Jesus, I'm off and running, and I am never looking back. In communion, God reaches out to embrace us, and we reach out to embrace him. I can't explain it, but I tell you, it is the absolute rock-solid gospel truth. I may be retiring in three months, but I have not yet obtained the prize and neither of you. We are all still on the way, so keep your eyes on Christ, strain forward, never look back, and remember, everything else is crap. <laughs> to God be the glory.